Hello, my name is Dr. Michael Glass. I'm the Regional Studies Association's Territorial Chair for the United States. The Regional Studies Association is a learned society concerned with the analysis of regions and regional issues. Through our international membership, we provide an authoritative voice of and network for academics, students, practitioners, and policymakers. You can find out more about the RSA, including information on membership, funding opportunities, and events at regionalstudies.org. I'm pleased to present a new installment of our Regionalists on Film series that introduces you to the work of established and emerging regional scholars and their scholarship. Today, it's my special privilege to introduce Professor Michael Storper. Professor Storper is the LSE Centennial Professor of Economic Geography. He's also affiliated with the Centre de Sociologie des Organisations at Sciences Po in Paris and the Department of Urban Planning in the School of Public Affairs at UCLA. Professor Storper is a corresponding fellow of the British Academy and Public Affairs at UCLA and has received the uh, Regional Studies Association's Peter Hall Prize for overall contributions to the field. His latest book is The Rise and Fall of Urban Economies with Stanford University Press. Hello, Professor Stolper. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Uh, perhaps if um, we can go into the, uh, the first uh, question in our conversation about how you first became interested in researching regions and regional development. Well, it happened when I um was looking to uh, do a graduate degree and i had done um i'd studied history and sociology as an undergraduate um at the university of california at berkeley and at that time which was in 1970s the u.s was undergoing uh its first big uh deindustrialization crisis in the old core northeast uh midwest of the u.s at the same time that the South was rapidly um, expanding through the migration of people and firms. And there were in my sort of the professors I had, there were lots of dimensions of that that were discussed, you know, the political dimensions, the geographical, um, the context of what it meant for the US working class, for cities, and so on. And, and I really wanted to work on that topic. So my first instinct was to do a, um, a degree in economics and um i started to do econ courses at berkeley and um loved them but when it came to the moment of figuring out if i was going to do a phd in economics i felt too restricted and in part i felt restricted because there were some members of the econ faculty um them itself who were sort of on you know what you might call in the terms of those days, sort of like the radical economists, labor economists and so on. And they sort of said to me, if you do this, you're gonna really have to walk the walk and talk the talk the way economics does it. And I just didn't have, I don't think I had the taste for that. Um, and exactly at that time, there were some young faculty members in the geography department who I sort of heard about through the Berkeley uh, grapevine and um went over to meet them uh one in particular dick walker who had just been hired and it was a student at david harvey's and i told him what i wanted to do and he said well you, you can do economic geography and i said well what is that i have no idea what geography is or anything like that but you know it seemed like a great thing so it was really kind of frankly on a whim um that worked out pretty well I would say so, and that ecumenicism in, in geography is, is perhaps fitting for you because um, while you're associated with, with economic geography and geography in general, uh, certainly you do have um, some, some um, interdisciplinarity that's, that's stayed with you through your work. Um, so since the 1970s, how has that uh, geographic tradition um, contributed to your scholarship moving ahead? I, you know, like you say geography is a is a very big tent and um it's a strength and a weakness of our discipline a strength in the sense that i think that we're not constrained by narrow paradigms um we have a lot of different ways we can approach just within human geography lots of different ways you can do it um for me there's been an evolution um i was trained in sort of marxist type approaches um, but I also secured, I also had a really strong background in sociology and um, a pretty good background in econ. 
And I kept those up because the geography pro program sort of allows you to take courses almost sort of where you want. It was like a lot of freedom. And um, I retain, you know, some of the like the critical inspiration that I got from the sort of Marxist stuff I was trained at. But frankly, I, I think I've evolved away from it in a couple of ways. One is um, that um, along with what's called in economics, the empirical turn there away from kind of pure theory to doing more empirically grounded economics um, and along with the evolution of new theories that help you do that, but also new, new kinds of data, um, I think I've kind of become in some ways more of like sort of more conventional in that way, but still, you know, with an eye to criticizing some of the, I think, unrealistic and overly restrictive ways that canonical economic models view geographical uh, and community processes. And I also do try to keep the interdisciplinary thing going where I think I get a lot of insights from other social sciences like sociology and political science. And somehow, you know, it becomes my, my mixture. Um, and it's really fun um, type of uh, perch to have in academia where one can do these, I think, creative blends. The trick is of course, maintaining the rigor. Right, and I think that both of those things are rather important or, or valuable uh, commodities to have as a researcher. The, the capacity to uh, the capacity to translate um, one's findings from discipline to discipline, just to expand your your um, uh, your ability to um, impart your your knowledge to others, um, but also to just have that that core strand that that unites your work. Would you say? Yeah. And I think having having you know being very clear on what one's core concerns are and what as a as a scientist as a social scientist you know what is one trying to do um, establish contribute to both you know within one's own discord uh, discipline but hopefully also to bring your perspective to the general social science and policy debate area. Uh, in a way that, you know, people that sort of like, you know, pushes the boundaries a little bit, right? Uh -huh. At the same time, it's drawing on all, frankly, all the really good things that are happening in the cognate disciplines. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that core concern. And I know you've been interested in, in uh, California's innovation systems for quite some time. And your most recent uh, work on regional innovation systems is, is looking at uh, the Los Angeles uh, region and the and the San Francisco region, and thinking about uh, perhaps some of the uh, limitations of standard explanations of economic change uh, to account for the divergence in the regional economies of those two areas within the state. Uh, would you care to explain uh, a little bit more about what you see happening there, and perhaps uh, what sort of focus you're taking now to create an explanation for those divergences? So, you know, I mean, I think the background for this is if you look from, say, the 80s or 90s onward, economic geographies of the entire world have been restructured by the third industrial revolution, right? We get the end of the manufacturing era, we get globalization, and we get this major wave of technological change, the digital and scientific type of uh, cognate scientific science based industries they create new geographies, new workforces, new wage structures, and they favor some places more than others. So there are like two core um, issues in uh, economic geography though, that really remain kind of unsolved. One is we know that each industrial revolution, it, 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 it arises in a set of places that will become the iconic cities and regions of that period. You know, like Manchester was in 1830 or Detroit was in 1920, well, it's Silicon Valley today, right? So one, we know that that happens and we have a lot of great work that we've done to establish the agglomerative clustering processes and how they work and what their properties are. The question we can't easily answer is, why in a particular place and not another one? Like why San Francisco and not, you know, Nashville, Tennessee? Uh, so that's one of the, the kind of big 
really like holy grail issues in our field is the link between the general process of making iconic places in each industrial ocean and the specific geographies of those processes. And the second one is the more general one that lots of people are onto nowadays, which is the growth of territorial inequality at an interregional scale be, uh, in the period of the third industrial revolution. So there's two problems, you know, are, I've done lots of work on different aspects of them, but they sort of come together in our California environment because you have two places that are star economies of the entire 20th century. And when the third industrial revolution comes around, one of them becomes the center of that revolution and the other one doesn't, even though their starting points are relatively similar if you describe them in the ways that economics would describe them, right? Education levels and you know specialization and all that kind of, indeed, if you were to like roll the film back, and you were in 1970, I think one would have guessed that LA would be the star uh, economy of the late 20th century and didn't turn out that way. It is a big, important uh, economy. There's no question about that, but it's not, not the center of the, of, of the tech world. And so we wanted to see why that's the case. And so the, the, the nice thing about it is it's kind of like a controlled experiment. Um, it's, a, you know, because these places resemble each other in a lot of ways. They're in the same state, in the same country, with the same legal system, and so on. Uh, but they go in very different um, ways. So um, what we do in our study is we, um, we do it as a kind of a treasure hunt, using sort of a lot of the hypotheses or models from economics and economic geography to see how well they explain this. And, you know, all of them contribute, labor migration, role of education, um, uh, the presence of, per, of you know, key in, um, innovators, uh, you can, a whole bunch of things that are well documented in our literature, but they, but taken together, they come up short in explaining uh, exactly why one place wins out and the other one's kind of a laggard and, and them as an example of diverging incomes because the per capita incomes between these two regions are now 30% different when they were basically identical in 1970 at the beginning of this process. That's, that's huge. It, it's almost a difference between, between high and middle income countries. So, you know, so what we do is we come up with, like if you're gonna say it in social scientific terms, it's a huge residual in, the, uh, in, in these standard explanations. And we come around and we did it through a, a, a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods, uh, looking at history, doing interviews, and then uh, confirming it with data that a, probably a big contributor to this residual is the different institutional structures of the two regions, meaning that the networks of people who are there and who create themselves at the beginning of this industrial revolution are really different. They come from different fields. They're, they're more unified and comprehensive in the Bay Area. They're more fragmented in, in LA. And we think that that contributed to the process by which the Bay Area captured uh, and reproduced the energy of this third industrial revolution and has kept it basically on top of the revolution ever since. And at the same time, LA's is a story of missed opportunities in the third industrial revolution. The LA economy does other things, but never enough to bring its per capita income up to its northern neighbor, which is kind of astonishing given it, how big, how otherwise prosperous, how kind of glamorous Southern California is, but it hasn't done that well compared to San Francisco and, and actually a set of five or six other um, more successful, at least in income terms, superstar metropolitan areas in America. So I think it's a really good kind of geographer's topic. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it raises the big question about how one can uh, train other regions to become responsive to the types of uh, processes that, that, LA, that, that LA missed. Because those opportunities, opportunities can be found everywhere. That's right. And so the, that's the point is that at any moment in time, you know, cities and regions, they start out with 
stocks of resources. And, you know, in economics, we tend to measure these in like very objective ways, you know, like what's the, you know, proportion of college educated and, you know, what are the productivity levels of the firms and, you know, what's exactly the kind of specialization of the economy and, you know, how do, you know, what are real costs of living compared to wages? There's all those things that we do in economics and they're all interesting and all important but they they sort of don't add up to an explanation of as the economy structurally changes around places what is it that, about how some of them react to these changes and sort of capture as it were the changes in a positive way while others do less so and that's i like i i call it kind of a holy grail problem for economic jobs because it's a problem of dynamics of how geographical development patterns are are created over and and changed over time, and economists. I mean, I, I'm not saying they're not interested in that. Sociologists, economists, but, you know, lots of disciplines are interested in it. It's an incredibly hard problem to solve, but I think you know at least that style of research start you know gives us some added elements in thinking about it. I think framing it as a holy grail is a really enticing proposition for the, the next generation of regional scholars coming up. Who doesn't want Absolutely. to grab for that? Uh, what are some of the other opportunities and challenges that, that, from your perspective, regional scholars are well positioned to address? I think there's a lot of them. Um, so today, I mean, the good news, I think, for regional scholars, as well as people in other social science disciplines is there's just amazing new kinds of data out there, right? So um, one of the things that's really interesting, you know, when you get to um, be sort of an experienced senior scholar is that as the, both the existing stock of knowledge changes from research that we're doing, but now new data and methods. So you've got to kind of like keep up with this. I mean, the way I do it is um, more and more I do team-based research because it's a way of um, bringing in and collaborating with people who have the talents to know how to mine all of this great new data. And I so um, for younger scholars, you know, that's I think really where a lot of the action is, meaning that we can take, for example, processes that we could only sort of describe in the past, but now we can actually measure them. And let me give an, I think the real big intersection is longer term historical perspectives on geographical settlement and economic change. So historians have done, there's some you know, wonderful historians, historical geographers, uh, economic historians, and so on. Um, but a lot of you know, what we are kind of constrained to do was to sort of describe from secondary sources and so on. Today, we can actually assemble data sets that go back a good century, maybe even more. And we can start to see how processes like industrial change, technological change, um, political shocks, uh, migration, uh, globalization, how they actually measurably affect the pattern of economic activity, the pattern of prosperity or lack of prosperity, uh, the fates of people as they move around. I mean, like new work on, on migration, for example, you can actually trace people across, you know, by matching census records and you can trace them over long periods and see, you know, how things change when they go from one place to another. So it's like all kinds of new insights that I think we can have uh, doing that. And I think the, uh, so, so, so now that's challenging though. And why is it challenging? So if you're a young researcher today, um, that means you would have to have a really good feeling for these historical processes. Secondly, you have to be pretty good with data and measurement and techniques. And third, I think you have to have a pretty good grounding in the useful um, theories of causality so you know what to do with the data. Um, yeah, I don't mean to, you know, I don't want to like say to younger scholars, oh my God, you know, it looks so horrible. It's actually like really, really fun. Um, and, and I think the state of the art is so much better than when I started out. 
And, and that for me would be you know, really exciting to be starting a research career today with that kind of stuff uh, because you can do so much more with it. Knowing that you don't need to do it all at once or master it all at once and that knowing right. that you don't need to do it all yourself. Um, those are two very big liberating factors, I'm sure. Yeah, um, and I think the teamwork thing is, I mean, I really emphasize that because I used to be much more of a lone ranger and I think that was a style of being a social scientist, you know, in the generation when I started out was, you know, you sat alone and write articles or books. Today, um, I would say there's still many great thinkers doing that and I applaud them. So it's not at all a sectarian thing I want to say, but at least the kind of stuff that I do, um, I think the teamwork part of it is, um, is a real um, sort of win-win situation for all the members of, uh, of the team who do it. Right, oh, thanks so much. Um, that is all the time we have available to talk with Professor Storper, uh, but I'd like to thank him for joining us today to share his perspective on regional scholarship. I'd also like to encourage all of you to learn more about regional studies and the Regional Studies Association at regionalstudies.org. But Professor Storper, would you care to have the last word today? Um, just to say, I think that um, the let's this is regional studies. So I think actually, you know, regions. It turns out are a really um, important basic level of insight into um, human affairs, into environmental affairs, into politics, and so on. And that's that's another really exciting part of um, being a regionalist. Our scale, it turns out, is more important than ever even in a highly globalized and interconnected world. And again, I think when I started out, uh, human geography was not looked at by the other social sciences as having like a really big topic. Today, everybody knows we do. So it's a really good thing to do. Thanks so much. Um, have a great day and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you for having me.